Well, welcome everybody to the to the uh, first of our new season of lectures for Towers of Faith. Uh, throughout lockdown, we were having uh, lectures almost weekly, just to try and sort of bide bide our time through the uh, uh, through the period of time that we were in. Uh, going forwards, we're probably going to be sort of going down to more sort of monthly meetings, but we will keep you abreast of all that's happening and, and what our who our speakers will be at that time. Uh, but tonight, uh, we are delighted to welcome uh, the Canon Doctor Paula Gooder. Uh, to speak to us on Saint Paul, sinner, saint, apostle and writer, quoted at length in and out of context, a character who provokes very strong reactions from many, but because of his letters making up great swathes of the New Testament and his mission to the Gentiles, for which we owe a great debt, he is therefore a character that cannot be ignored, uh, no matter um, any controversy that may surround him or that follows him. So in this lecture, uh, we hopefully we will experience Paul as the man that we cannot ignore whether we would like to or not. And our speaker this evening, Paula Gooder, is a prominent New Testament theologian, speaker and writer. Her research areas focus on the writings of St. Paul the Apostle, with particular focus on 2 Corinthians and Paul's understanding of the body. Uh, she is passionate about enthusing people to read the Bible by offering the best of biblical scholarship possible in an engaging way. Paula began working life teaching at Ripon College, Cudston, where all of the best priests are trained. Uh, and at the Queen's Foundation in Birmingham. And this was then followed by eight years as an itinerant speaker write, and writer in biblical studies before taking a post with the Bible Society as their theologian in residence. And that was followed up by becoming the Director of Mission, Learning and Development for the Diocese of Birmingham. And in 2019, uh, the best diocese in the country managed to bag uh, Paula to come and be the Canon Chancellor at St Paul's Cathedral here in the Diocese of London. She is widely published writing resources for Lent and Advent and contributing to the very well-received Pilgrim course. Uh, and also New Testament and her most recent uh, book is a historical fiction book entitled Phoebe, A Story, which is very good indeed and well worth a read. Uh, Paula, thank you very much for being with us this evening and uh, I'll hand over to you. So, um, so Paul, why you need to read him, whether you like him or not, um, was the title I went with. Um, I think for me, one of the really interesting things about Paul is that um, there, it's not true to say that the world splits into two camps, but it almost splits into two camps. Those who read Paul and almost nothing else in the New Testament, um, and those who um, never read Paul um, and only read other parts of the New Testament. Um, and um, one of the things that is often very striking is the way in which people um, assume um, things about you if you are a Pauline scholar. They assume something about your theology, their, your background, and they assume all sorts of things about what you're going to think about various issues. Um, so what I want to do uh, this evening is actually to present to you uh, maybe a different kind of Paul. Um, but at least to raise questions about why Paul is, in my opinion, so very important and why actually you don't, act, you don't need to agree with him. You don't have to enjoy reading some of his epistles, but you do need to recognise that actually he contributes something vital to our understanding of faith and who we are as Christians. So there is actually just one answer I want to give to the question of um, why you re need to read Paul. Um, and my, and then I'm going to, you will gather, uh, having given you one answer, I will then um, wander around um, talking about all sorts of other things as well. But the kind of my key answer to why you need to read Paul is Paul was the very first theologian who asked the question, what difference does Christ make? Um, and for me, one of the really interesting things is to see him wrestling through his epistles with that question. What difference does it make that Christ came, that Christ died, and that Christ rose again? That's really kind of the central question in Paul's um, writings. And I just want to kind of explore with you um, why that becomes so very important. Um, and uh, it's got all sorts of different strands, which I will pull on as I go through the talk. Um, and then we can pick up various of them in the questions at the end. Um, so we need to begin by having a think about the very many faces of Paul. Um, I alluded earlier on to those who um, love Paul a bit too much and those who love Paul a little bit too little. Um, I think one of the really striking things is one of the 
often what happens when we interpret Paul or when we encounter Paul is that we don't encounter Paul, we encounter the layers upon layers upon layers of people who have opinions about Paul, um, what they thought about him, who they thought he was. Um, it is very hard these days actually to encounter Paul himself. Um, and um, this evening, you will encounter my Paul, um, who will be different from other people's Paul. Um, so ja, let's just be clear that actually it is very, very difficult to read Paul um, as though for, for the very first time. So where do we see some of the layers about Paul? We'll return to this in a moment, um, but the, one of the layers is the Acts of the Apostles. And uh, many of you will know that uh, one of the interesting things is that the Paul you encounter from the Acts of the Apostles is not the same Paul, necessarily, as the Paul you encounter from his own epistles. Um, then you get into an interesting wrangle about which one you believe, to which, um, and I like I say, I will come back to this. For me, the really interesting issue is, actually, I believe both of them. Because what you get is Paul's perception of himself in his epistles. In Acts, you get Luke's perception, assuming it was written by Luke, um, of who Paul was. Um, and if we had other accounts, you would get different perceptions again. So we have these kind of already right in the early church, the different perceptions of Paul, who he was um, and what he came to do. And then add on to that, you have other layers of perceptions. So you've got later tradition. Um, my own personal favourite um, bit of later tradition is the Acts of Paul and Thecla, where you get a really intriguing insight into what they thought Paul was. Um, and most importantly, probably the only description we've got of Paul's physical experience, um, physical appearance. And if you know the Acts of Paul and Thecla, you will know that it is far from a flattering um, account of Paul's physical appearance. Um, he um, is described as having bow legs, eyebrows that meet in the middle, and being spectacularly ugly. But, the Acts of Paul and Thecla say, um, he had the face of an angel. Um, I think there's something in that about the essence of Paul. He was someone who was perhaps not um, great to look at, but had something that he communicated by through who he was. Then, of course, you get the Paul of artwork. Um, and as you will notice on the slides that I show you this evening, I've tried to scatter um, through them um, a whole load of different perceptions of what Paul looks like. Um, of course, he always has a beard because, as, as we will explore in a moment, he is Jewish. Um, but you have other different pers um, perspectives of what Paul um, might or might not have looked like. Um, just one thing you never get of Paul, um, which intrigues me in the artwork, is you never get a young Paul. And one of the questions we might like to kick around when we come to the questions um, is why not? Um, one of the questions we have of Paul is, um, was he married? No evidence that he was. And if he was not married in a culture which expects you to be married, why was he not married? One explanation is that at his conversion, he was too young to be married, which would have put him at the age of about 13 or 14. Um, it's only a speculative um, question. Um, it is quite probable that he was older than that. But nevertheless, it raises you some fascinating questions of why we never see young Paul in artwork. Why do we only ever get him, as you will see in, from some of these pictures, as a slightly older man? Um, and then you get Pauline theology. Um, and what I'm going to be doing this evening is presenting to you the tiniest, tiny slice of Pauline theology. Um, if you even had to look at the books on my bookshelf, you would see that the books on um, Pauline theology go on endlessly. I've only got a tiny proportion of books written on Paul um, comparatively, um, and they are, um, there's about 500 of them on my shelf alone. Um, the Paul of Pauline theology, um, again, has layers upon layers upon layers, um, depending on where you come from, what your views are. Um, and so therefore, we have these layers of layers of um, the many faces of Paul. So in answer to my question, why should you read Paul? Um, I'm going to focus around three particular responses. Um, you should read Paul because of who he was. You should read Paul because of his theology, and you should read Paul because of what he wrote about. 
those for me are the three key features and I'll just kind of very quickly um, run through the kind of the nub of um, the arguments in each one of those and as I've said in the questions we can pick up any more details about them but before we do any of that um, we need to note something um, which we um, I've already alluded to a few times um, there's a real challenge in reconstructing Paul. Very, very famously, one of the historical Jesus scholars noted that the problem with the quest for the historical Jesus is that it was like looking down a well and seeing your own face at the bottom. It's as much true of Paul as it is of the historical Jesus. And it is remarkable that Pauline scholars always end up with a Paul that looks really quite like them. Um, so Luther ended up with a Paul that looked quite like Luther. Um, I would argue Tom Wright ends up with a Paul that looks quite like Tom Wright. Um, I think I probably also need to add that I will end up with a Paul that looks, well, not physically like me, I sincerely hope, but definitely theologically like me. So we end up with that lens of reading Paul, which is very difficult to see around, and we just need to be honest about that. But there are other problems as well. Um, again, I've already noted the problems of the reliability of Acts. We see a particular kind of Paul presented in Acts, and he's not necessarily the same kind of Paul as you find in Paul's own epistles. That begins to raise us questions about how much we trust Acts. Um, does Acts give us historical details um, that we can rely on, or do we have to be suspicious about them? Or could we lay, weigh them against what Paul says and see where we get to? Another thing that's just worth noting is that um, there are very scarce personal references to Paul's wider life. So, for example, we know, possibly or possibly not, from Romans 16 verse 7, that Paul had relatives. Um, Acts also refers to the possibility that Paul had relatives. One of the hidden nuggets of Acts that a lot of people don't notice is that when Paul is about to be ambushed in Jerusalem, um, he's saved from the plot by his nephew. And that raises some fascinating questions about um, who, who Paul's sister was or brother um, and what connection he had um, with them. And why does he not mention them anywhere else? Um, who were they? Where did they come from? Um, but it just illustrates the frustration of reading Paul that we um, know very little about who he was um, personally from his family um, background. So when we try and reconstruct Paul, we do end up trying to put together a jigsaw um, in which at least some other pieces are missing. And therefore, that's why we end up with um, a, pic a picture of Paul that looks very much like ourselves because we, we put into the jigsaw the bits of details that we have that we would understand. But let's have a go at answering these three questions about the significance of Paul and who he was. The first thing to note um, is Paul's birthplace place and its significance. Um, as I'm sure most of you know, um, Paul um, is noted both in Acts and in his own epistles of having been born in Tarsus in Cilicia. And at this moment, I realise there is a missing slide that I forgot to insert. Um, I got distracted by a phone call and then forgot to come back and do it. Um, what I needed to do is put you a map on where Tarsus in Cilicia is, but you're all happily on your computers and can go and find yourself a map of where Tarsus is if you're not quite sure. But it is in um, the south of what we would now call Turkey um, in, then, in those days, Asia Minor. So born in Tarsus in Cilicia, brought up in this city at the feet of Gamaliel, um, according to Acts 22. So we therefore have one feature which we can begin with, is, which is that Paul was heavily influenced by Greek um, culture. There's a big discussion among scholars about precisely what the impact was on Paul of growing up in a largely Greek-speaking, Greek-influenced, Greek-cultured city. Um, and as you will probably imagine, various people have different views on precisely the influence on Paul's thinking. But there can be no doubt that actually his location in a Greek city was actually quite significant for Paul's education. 
I'm just going to start at the end of the slide and work backwards, actually. One of the things that's really intriguing about Tarsus um, that we often forget these days is that um, for the residents of Tarsus, it was a moment of great civic pride that to, for them to say that they had a great reputation in philosophy. While it's slightly disputed um, by modern scholars, both Dio Cassius and Strabo argue um, that Tarsus was second only to Athens for its philosophical knowledge um, in this period. Um, like I say, we could dis dispute that and we could discuss it for quite a long time, but what it does tell us is that someone who was born in Tarsus was very heavily located within the Greek philosophical tradition. And you can find strands of that in Paul's writings. I think one of the things we have to be very careful about, however, when we're looking at the strands of Greek philosophical thinking in Paul's writings, is not to assume that there is one big lump. Um, often what people do when they're discussing Paul, and um, particularly Second Temple Judaism, is assume that there is a big split between Judaism and Greek thinking. And you have to say, was somebody Jewish or were they um, influenced by Hellenism? Um, and what modern um, Pauline scholarship is very clear about, and in fact, Second Temple Judaism scholarship um, is clear too, that actually that's the wrong question to ask. Because the, the problem with that is, is that there was nowhere, and this includes Jerusalem um, in the first century, um, there was nowhere that was purely Jewish, um, divorced entirely from Hellenism. Um, wherever you lived in the Roman Empire, you had an influence of Hellenism. The question is the extent of the influence of Hellenism. And there's no doubt from Paul's writings that he is heavily influenced by Greek philosophy. The however bit is recognizing that not all Greek philosophy is the same. And just saying that Paul is influenced by one form of Greek philosophy doesn't mean he's influenced by all forms of Greek philosophy. So every time you want to say, is Paul influenced by Stoicism? Or is he influenced by Platonism? Um, or is he influenced by Aristotelianism? Actually, you have to ask that specific question and you have to ask the specific question of a specific text. Does this text show you evidence of his Greek philosophical background? So while it is clear to say that Paul is influenced by Greek philosophy, you can't therefore assume that everything is influenced by Greek philosophy. And if anyone's read, read my book on Paul and the body, you'll know that one of the things I do argue is that I don't think Paul was Platonist when he, when he comes to his theology of the soul. Um, he is um, Greek philosophical in other areas. But I don't see personally see evidence of Platonism in Paul's understanding of the body and the soul. Um, so what we have, therefore, is that recognition that Paul does have clear Greek philosophical influences. Um, but he was also very clearly a diaspora Jew. Um, and this becomes quite significant, I think, when you think, begin to think about Paul, is that when you you think about diaspora Judaism, the spread of Judaism outside of the Holy Land at the, um, from the first, in the first century and earlier. One of the crucial features of diaspora Judaism is learning how to live um, in a culture which was largely Hellenistic. So there are parts of the culture which you accept, but also parts of the culture which you reject. And I would argue that you can see in Paul's writings both that absolute clear zeal for certain levels of rejection and absolute clear zeal for certain levels of acceptance and recognizing that that actually functions underneath his um, personality and beliefs as well. This brings us to the word brought up, which um, I've been talking for a while. So let me take you back to the um, quote so that you can see it. Um, in Acts, Luke, um, assuming Luke is the author of Acts, says of Paul, or says, puts the words in Paul's mouth, I am a Jew brought up in this city at the feet of Gamaliel. And there is quite extensive discussion for this particular in instance. Um, so you get um, kind of wide variety of opinions on this. So Van Unick would argue that actually being brought up in Jerusalem had almost no influence on Paul's thinking. Whereas Hengel would argue that it had a deep influence on his education and mindset. 
Um, and in a way, it is very, very difficult to know precisely um, what influence that his Jerusalem location had on his upbringing. But clearly what you get then is this person who can straddle cultures and it's that which is worth bearing in mind. So we have someone who is Greek in background. We have someone who um, lives in diaspora Judaism. Um, we have someone who was brought up um, to a certain extent within Jerusalem. We then just need to raise, it's a side question really, because it's not really vastly important, but I find it just mildly interesting to ask the question um, about Paul being a Roman citizen. It's mentioned three times in Acts, um, in Acts 22 and 23, um, where Paul, um, according to Luke, says that he is a Roman citizen. Um, and that raises us a very interesting question. Firstly, was Paul a Roman citizen? Paul doesn't mention it, in, but you could argue that he didn't mention it because it wasn't significant for him. Um, or you could argue it, um, that he didn't mention it because he wasn't a Roman citizen. And I think one of the interesting questions is finding the evidence for whether Paul was in fact a Roman citizen. The frustrating thing is that we simply don't know. Um, we don't know um, where that tradition came from in Luke. Um, one of the fascinating things for me is that um, it would be very, very unusual for someone um, with Paul's background um, to be given citizenship. Rutzel argues quite strongly that it would be very unusual for someone who came um, that far east to be given Roman citizenship. Um, it doesn't mean that he wasn't, but it, you do have to construct a scenario in which it might be possible for Paul to be granted Roman citizenship. And you have kind of all sorts of questions around that. And then, of course, we have our third strand of Paul, which is a crucial and significant one, which is that he was a Pharisee. Um, let me just talk a little bit about Pharisaism, because I think it is quite an important feature. Um, the growth of Second Temple Judaism scholarship in the last um, kind of 40 to 50 years has shown us that actually a Christian understanding of Pharisaism um, has kind of really kind of um, been wrongly constructed. You would be forgiven for thinking if the only thing you knew about Pharisaism was um, your reading of the Gospels, that Pharisees were mean, nitpicky, pedantic um, people who were trying to catch people out the whole time, um, that kind of, you know, in fact, so much so that the word Pharisee has passed into our modern language um, as a description of somebody who is really not to be trusted, who's slightly hypocritical um, and pedantic. Um, fascinatingly, if you read at texts outside of the New Testament, Pharisaism was an incredibly attractive form of Judaism. And the, what we know um, is that Josephus and Paul both elected to become Pharisees. So for me, one of the really interesting issues around um, Pharisaism is that whole question of why Pharisaism was so attractive. Um, and you can just kind of transfer that over into some of the um, arguments in the Gospels, I think, very interestingly. The reason I think that Jesus and the Pharisees came into conflict quite so regularly was that they were trying to argue for the same type of belief, but just differently articulated. Because if you were a Jew in the first century, it was entirely possible for you to be a devout Jew and worship God three times a year at three major festivals. Um, particularly if you lived outside of Jerusalem, then actually your devotion um, was very sporadic. The Pharisees were arguing that the really key element about devotion um, in the Second Temple period was that it could be expressed in your daily life. It was how you lived your life, what you did as a part of your life that actually expressed your devotion to God. And the Pharisees had very clear ideas about what that devotion could look like. Um, obviously, Jesus's ideas were different, but they were still about um, daily devotion to God. And for me, the fascinating thing is that Paul, um, who was originally somebody who elected to follow Pharisaism, then became a follower of Jesus because it was a similar kind of interest. So we've got this very fascinating character then in Paul from his background. 
someone who was trained in Greek philosophy, someone who has grown up as a diaspora Jew, someone who had elected um, to follow a form of Judaism which was about daily devotion and engagement in the everyday with your faith, and someone who may or may not have been a Roman citizen. There is an argument that it is those strands of Paul that made him so very influential in the first century because almost nobody else could have managed to do what Paul did in the melding together of his Jewish understanding with his Hellenistic background. Um, there would have been a few people, but not very many of them. So it could be that the real influence of Paul um, comes from those kind of three strands of his life. Very quickly, I'd just like to talk about Paul's conversion before we move on to having a look a little bit about his theology and a little bit about his epistles. Lion scholarship is the nature of Paul's conversion. What did Paul's conversion mean to him? And um, if you know anything about Pauline theology, you will know that this is kind of one of the real nubs of discussion. So the traditional view from Martin Luther is that Paul was burdened with guilt at his knowledge of his own sin and his inability to fulfill the law, and as a result converted to, Jew to Christianity um, at, on the road to Damascus as a sense of relief that he was able now to be able to um, do something that he otherwise wouldn't have been able to do before. Um, in great contrast, you have other scholars, and um, Krista Stendhal is a really interesting example, um, of saying that actually Paul wasn't converted at all. He was simply commissioned. So he didn't change um, particularly. The really key element for Krista Stendhal is that Paul was simply commissioned just like Jeremiah was, just like Isaiah was. He was sent to do a task. There was no great change in him. Um, you get people like Alan Siegel, um, who kind of, kind of have a kind of a midway um, house really, which is that Paul was converted and did change radically, but he was called onwards into a prophetic um, life, a prophetic ministry, and that what he was doing was largely a prophetic calling. At the heart of all of these discussions um, is simply this question. Could you, at the time of Paul's conversion, um, transfer from Judaism to Christianity? Was it something that could be done? My own view is that Paul was converted, but not converted religiously. He was converted internally. Um, I don't think it was possible at the time of Paul's conversion to change from Judaism to Christianity. Um, I think that the, um, the growing alongside each other of Judaism and Christianity continued for a very long time after um, Paul's conversion, um, as far as the fourth century, I would argue. Um, and that in what was going on in Paul's experience um, on the Damascus Road was something else. And it's that something else which is, for me, the really crucial bit. Because something happened for Paul on the road to Damascus that changed him um, entirely, changed his mindset, changed his inner location, changed what he believed about himself, about God and about the world. So I would say you can call that a conversion experience, even though you might not want to be able to say that's um, a change of religion, as I wouldn't want to say. And I would argue that right at the heart of Paul's theology, and this is why I wanted to talk about this before we get onto the theology, is Paul's um, realization that something that he had thought was, the, was absolutely abhorrent about what followers of Jesus said was in fact the case. And that what happened on the road to Damascus so changed his mind that he could no longer understand the world um, in the way that he used to do it. Um, I'm just going to tell you a theory by someone called John Bowker, which I don't agree with, but I think actually gets to the heart of what really happened for Paul on the road to um, Damascus. So John Bowker argues that Paul was a Jewish mystic. That bit I don't disagree with, and you can ask me questions about that later if you're interested. I actually do think Paul was influenced by Jewish mysticism. But the bit that I don't agree with is that John Bowker argues that um, as Paul was traveling on the road to Damascus, he was um, conjuring up a vision of God's throne. 
And as he worked his way through um, his vision of God's throne, he eventually saw the face of the person who was seated on God's throne. And at that moment, he realized it was Jesus. And when he realized that the person seated on God's throne was Jesus, all the pieces of the jigsaw went up in the air and fell down for Paul in a completely different way. And once he realized that, um, his theology changed forever. Now, like I say, I, I don't agree with Bowker's particular theory, but I do think there's something in it in terms of what Paul encountered on the road to Damascus. Because there's something about the discussion that you get in Acts between Paul and the voice from heaven, which I think is really, really interesting. So um, in the discussion um, between Paul and the voice from heaven, um, you have the flash of light. And as any good Jew of the period, Paul would have known that a flash of light and a voice from heaven was God. That was a, known as a theophany, um, an experience of God. Um, and when the voice spoke, the voice said, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Now, the whole point for Paul was that he was defending God and not persecuting him. So you can hear kind of those pieces beginning to fall into place already at that moment. Well, why do you think I'm persecuting you? And what's interesting is he responds to the voice, um, who are you, Lord? And the word Lord, I think, is the crucial bit for recognizing that what he's saying is, um, who are you, the one who is seated on the throne, um, the throne of God? And my view of Pauline theology is that at that moment, Paul suddenly realized quite how wrong he had been and that the one seated on God's throne was Jesus. And if he accepted that, then absolutely everything else then had to change. So I would say that the really crucial bit about understanding Paul is that experience. And you find Paul referring to it again and again and again in his epistles. And my view is that having realized that the one seated on the throne was Jesus, he then had to make sense of the rest of his theology. And what you find in his epistles are, is Paul's wrestling to make sense of the rest of his theology in the light of that. Just a little tiny trivial thing, which is always worth noting, I think, is it is said so very often by people that um, Saul was Paul's pre-Christian name and Paul was his post-Christian name. He changed his name to Paul when he became a Christian. Fascinatingly, there is no evidence of this whatsoever. And there's a very strong argument, I would say, for him always having both names, if he was a Roman citizen. If he wasn't, it's different. But if he was a Roman citizen, you could argue quite clearly that Paul had both names. So Saul was Paul's Jewish name. It's associated with the tribe of Benjamin, goes all the way back to King Saul, and demonstrates his lineage within Judaism. Paul would be his Roman name. Um, and, but fascinatingly, if he did have a Roman name, he would have had three parts to his name. Um, a good example is Julius Caesar, whose full name was Gaius Julius Caesar. Gaius was um, Caesar's praenomen, his given name. Julius was his nomen, and Caesar was his cognomen. So he had a given name, a founding tribe name, and a family name. The word, the name Paulus, um, occurs most often um, in Roman history as a cognomen as a family name, which would mean that he, his father was also called Paul. Um, and it raises some very, very interesting questions about um, why he only ever mentions his one Roman name and not his other two Roman names, if in fact he was a Roman citizen. Of course, it's also worth noting that it could have been a nickname, um, the name Paulus meaning small. Um, and as we know from the Acts of Paul and Thecla, Paul was small um, if the acts of Paul and Thecla was threat. So it's possible that it was a nickname. Um, and therefore, what he did was when he traveled in Jewish circles, he used his Jewish name. When he traveled in Roman circles, he used his Roman name. Um, and added to that, um, the kind of intriguing little quirk is that if you put Saul into Greek, it becomes the word saulos which means to mince like a prostitute, um, which might suggest 
that actually it wouldn't be the best name to be using in a Greek stroke Roman context. So where are we then in his theology? Let me now kind of just begin to kind of sketch out what I think are the two key and driving strands of um, Paul's theology. Um, the first one, which is the, the strands that you find rumbling, particularly in Romans and Galatians, um, not quite so strongly elsewhere, but that whole question of whether you needed to be Jewish in order to follow Christ. Um, what you discover in the first century is that this is the live question. It's the question of the century. And of course, um, people answered it differently. And it's worth us just reminding ourselves um, of the fact that when it was first asked, the answer was really, really obvious. Do you need to be Jewish in order to, to be able to follow Jesus? Well, of course you do, because Jesus was Jewish, and so were all the early church, um, until you encounter Paul's ministry. So do you need to be Jewish? Of course, yes. So how do you become Jewish? Well, that's when the circumcision issue comes in, because if you want to convert into Judaism, um, the only way to do it is to do it um, through circumcision. So the whole question around Paul's theology is, do you need to be Jewish in order to follow Christ? So Jerusalem, the Jerusalem church answered yes. You remember Peter from Acts after the Cornelius vision said no ish. Um, and I just want to come back to the ish in a moment. Paul um, said no. So you have these um, positions. The Jerusalem church, absolutely you need to be Jewish to be Christian. Paul, absolutely you don't need to be Jewish to be Christian. Peter no, I don't think you do because of the Cornelius vision. But there then becomes a really, really significant consequence. And although the way in which it's described in the New Testament means that Peter doesn't really come out of this very well, actually, I think um, Peter's um, answer reveals to you something really very significant about the complexity of um, this question, do you need to be Jewish in order to follow Christ? Because if you say no, and it's all right for Gentiles to follow Christ in the way that um, Jews do, um, and, and this is crucial, if you say right at the heart of Christian, early Christian worship is table fellowship, then every time a Jew um, celebrates with table fellowship um, the other with the other people in the community, they render themselves impure. And when they render themselves impure, they render themselves unable to go back to their non-Christian Jewish families um, until they've purified themselves again. So for us, it seems quite a straightforward and simple question. Uh, but for them, it became really community dividing because it meant that what they were really saying was you have to leave your family and join the new family of Christ. When you realize that, you realize actually some of the dynamism underneath a lot of what Paul talks about, and certainly a lot of what Jesus talks about, that leaving of your family and joining a new family becomes very strong and very resonant. And you then begin to understand why it was so complex for people like Paul, um, who struggled with these kind of issues. So that's one strand, which is vital, I think, throughout Paul's theology. But the other strand is equally significant. Um, this is where, um, and this strand comes to the fore, both in Romans and in the Corinthian epistles. It's there in Philippians, and it's also in Ephesians, though we can kind of have a discussion about whether we think that's Pauline if we want to later. Um, and that the second strand, I think, is equally important to the Judaism and Gentile strand, which is Paul's understanding of two ages. And I just need to kind of talk you into this a little bit because it is so very significant in Paul. So Paul, like any good Jew of the period, believed that um, there was this age. Um, and this age, which um, in Hebrew you would have called Ha'olam um, Haze, which is the world, this one, so this world. Um, and when you know that phrase, you'll see it coming, coming over and over again in Paul's writings. This age is an age that is marked by who we are now, um, and you looked forward to the ending of this age. There would come a moment in the future when God would um, climatically intervene in the life of the world. And when God intervened in the life of the world, the world would become as God had always wanted it to be. 
where there was peace and harmony and good news um, and just read Isaiah and you get that sense of what they were looking forward to. The really important thing, however, for a Pharisee, and this is why it's important to have in your mind that Paul was influenced by Pharisaism, that Pharisees believed in the resurrection of the dead. And what they believed about the resurrection of the dead is the marker of the intervention of God's coming into the world was that the dead would be raised. So imagine you are a good Pharisee who believes in the resurrection of the dead and that that is a marker of the coming of God's kingdom. And then imagine that you believe that someone has been raised from the dead. His name is Jesus Christ. And that therefore that moment, the downward line on my slide at the moment, that moment has now happened and the end of the age has um, begun. Of course, the problem is that actually the world still looks pretty much like it always did. The Romans are still in control. Israel, um, there are no li li lions lying down with lambs. Um, the, the hills have not brought forth and clapped their, the trees are not clapping their hands. All of those things you know would be the case um, aren't in fact the case. And then what you need to try and do is work out, well, what does this mean in this particular context? And so what Paul's theology does is provide a person who believes about in the world in that kind of way with a framework that begins to make sense of it. So I try and depict it like this on the slide, but it doesn't quite do it. Um, it's very difficult to do it in a two-dimensional way. You rather need it in a three-dimensional way. But Paul's theology is absolutely um, underpinned by this belief that Jesus' resurrection has begun the age to come. The age to come um, has already begun with Jesus' resurrection. And consequently, we are living between this age and the age to come. And so therefore, um, the body of Christ, life in Christ, life in the spirit, is all an experience of the resurrection lived early. And so what you have is this great clashing of the principles of the old age with the principles of the age to come the things that were and the things that will be. Um, that's what underpins Paul's theology. So therefore, what you get in Paul's theology is this overwhelming idealism about resurrection life and what it's going to be like when, in the age to come, clashing constantly with what the reality is um, in the world in which we live. And for me, one of the kind of the crucial bits about Paul and why Paul's theology is actually quite so inspiring is that Paul has this vision of us dwelling between this age and the age to come, the world as it is now and the world as it will be. And that is the Christian existence. Um, and that's what Paul is kind of talking about so often in his writings. I've been talking a little bit too much. I'm just going to slip over the next slide. Um, and I just want to talk very quickly about Paul's epistles and then we can get on to um, a conversation about it. So why should you read Paul? You should read Paul because he's a remarkable person with these really fascinating strands of background which intermingle in his writings, which you can begin to see. Why should you read Paul? You should read Paul because his theology is actually really fascinating. Whether you agree with it or not, there's a fascinating edge to Paul's theology, which is about um, this whole existence between the world that was and the world to come. Why should you read Paul? Because of his epistles. Um, around half of the New Testament, as you will know, is attributed to Paul. And whether um, you go with the maximum um, 14 epistles attributed to Paul, whether you go with 13, um, which is the more common number these days, or whether you go with a much smaller number, as some people do, um, whether you take off Ephesians or Colossians or two Thessalonians. Um, nevertheless, Pauline theology, as opposed to Johannine theology, as opposed to Lucan theology, as opposed to um, the other Catholic epistles theology, is a really important slice of writing in the New Testament. And therefore we need to understand what it's about in order to understand what was going on in the first century. And for me, that's a really crucial element. The other thing to recognize, and this is very important in my understanding of Paul, is that the epistles represent a conversation 
Um, many of the epistles, though not all of them, are conversations between Paul and the communities that he's founded. Fascinatingly, um, there are some that are not. So Romans is not a conversation because as we know, Paul um, hadn't been to Rome at that point. So wasn't talking with the people in the same kind of way. But my own favorite epistles, one and two Corinthians, are a dynamic conversation between Paul and his community. And you know this because throughout, um, he refers to letters that they've written to him. And he'll say, now concerning, which clearly indicates that they've asked him questions and he's now answering the questions. So he's not laying out, in my view, a systematic theology. What he's doing is having an, a theological conversation. And for me, it's that theological conversation. It's the mode of Paul's theology, which is really interesting. So for me, um, what's going on in Paul is that Paul is working out the answer to this question that I mentioned right at the start of this, which is actually, what does this mean? Um, who was this person? What difference does it make that Jesus died and rose again? Um, the fascinating thing about Paul, um, just very quickly, because you might want to have a conversation about this, is Paul is apparently not interested in Jesus's life. He's only interested in his death and resurrection. The, the comments about Paul's life are few and far between. Um, we have mentions of the Last Supper. Um, we have a couple of mentions about Mary, um, a couple of mentions about um, um, who Jesus was and what he came to do, but almost nothing about Jesus's life. Um, so what Paul is doing is asking that question of what difference does it make to somebody who hasn't met the historical Jesus, the physical Jesus? The reason why I think Paul is so very important for us to read is we haven't met that person either, the historical Jesus. We've met the, the Jesus that Paul met. Um, and therefore, he helps us to begin to formulate some interesting questions. Um, but the place where I want to end, um, and which is for me the really crucial bit, is the bit that often people miss when they're reading Paul, is that every single of his epistles um, has a blend of theology, but also what I would call applied theology. Um, the crucial question, <laughs> I just realized I have a typo on my um, screen, not how no shall I live, but how now shall I live, very, very importantly. Actually, what difference does it make to how I live my life? What difference does it make to who I am as a Christian? What difference does it make to my relationships, to the decisions I make? For me, the crucial bit about Paul and the reason why we should read um, Paul is that Paul is asking those questions. What difference does it make that the Jesus who died and rose again, the Jesus that Paul met on the road to Damascus, to Damascus what difference does that person make to who I am as a person? And until we become better at asking those kind of questions, um, actually, um, we need to keep on reading Paul and reading Paul and reading Paul, because then you begin to get some kind of insight into it. Enough from me already. Um, I hope that will give us um, enough to begin to have um, an interesting conversation as we go. Wow, that's absolutely amazing. Thank you so much. Lots of clapping I can see uh, from all of the faces here, uh, everybody turning their cameras back on and clapping. Thank you so much. Uh, I, I think uh, for me, uh, how we see Paul and you're opening it up there at the start is quite often it's, it's like looking into a hole and, and seeing yourself back. And so when you talk about how Paul looked and how he interacted, that he was bow-legged and quite ugly, I suddenly found him very relatable. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I, I think you're, you're, uh, you're, you're talking about him being the first theologian, the first person who's trying to work these questions out, who's asking these questions, is the thing that makes him most relatable. And especially for those of us who are, who are here tonight, who are, who are attempting to answer those questions. What, what, what difference does it, does, does Christ's death and resurrection really make in, in our lives? And that's, that's a challenging, that's a really challenging view, I think, because we can get caught up in the one-dimensional Paul. And I remember once when I was having a, a, a little bit of a, a tough time, a certain, uh, a certain bishop who thought he was helping said to me, you need to read more Peter and less Paul. Um, <laughs> so that, that, no, no. 
<laughs> so that one dimensional view is is not yeah. is is not helpful and i must admit i'd not really thought uh, about the, uh, the 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 conversion question uh, and the question of the way that we think about the pharisees particularly around circumcision uh, clearly being such a such a big thing and i love your uh, your rounding up of that as it, the answer of course was no ish and I'm not quite certain how circumcision can be no-ish. <laughs> um, but it's, it's it, that, that, that question of table fellowship underlines and highlights, I think, that uh, what Paul is doing is trying to figure out the practical outworking. He's, he's working out the questions, and you can see that going on in his writing. So uh, thank you very much for opening up Paul, revealing such a complex character a multi-layered human and um i'm certainly going to go back and reread the epistles with that human paul in in my mind thank you so much uh now we've got uh, i'm going to throw forward uh paul if you excuse me to a couple of weeks time uh when we have stacy rand coming to speak to us about edith stein and that's going to be oh, absolutely wow. yeah. excellent it's, excellent I, I, to my sh great shame, I knew very little about Edith Stein, and I've been reading about her this afternoon. So join us again in two weeks for that. The details are on towersoffaith.com. But I'm going to hand over to Father Chris now, and he's going to corral all of the questions. You can wave at him, or you can use the, uh, the little digital hand, and he'll be able to see you. Thank you, Father Matthew. You've stolen my thunder and said what I was about to say. That's that's absolutely fine. Thank you very much for that. Um, I, I I wonder actually while we while we're all thinking about questions, um, I, I am a bit of a linguist myself, and um, Paul, I wonder if you could say something about what your favourite translation of um, well maybe the New Testament, but the, the epistles in particular um, is and why. <laughs> um, I'm going to be really geeky now. Um, it's that one, the Greek New Testament. Um, and I <laughs> thought you'd like that, Chris. Um, I don't like translations, is my problem. Um, and the trouble is when anyone says to me, what's your favourite translation? I want to say, well, what, what do you want it for? Um, if you want it for reading out in church, then I can tell you some of my favourites. If you want for personal study, I can tell you some others of my favourites. Um, if you want for someone whose English isn't very good, um, either because um, their literary, um, they're, 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 they're not, their reading age is lower or because they're not first language English speakers, then I would go for something else. Um, so I kind of always want to say, so my question is always, um, what do you want it for? And then I'll tell you what my favourite is. But I'm going to break my rule this evening um, and say to you, um, Nicholas King is the one that I would recognise or re uh, recommend for reading Paul, um, because I think he just time and time again um, hits it, the nail on the head. I go, that is it. That is a really brilliant translation. Oh, look, Father Matthew's pulling him off the shelf there. There he is. <laughs> Um, it's, it's an astoundingly good piece of scholarship um, and he manages to meld together readability with um, accuracy in a really um, kind of remarkable way. So there you go. I've broken my lifetime rule and recommended one for you. That's okay. I thoroughly endorsed that as well. I sat at, uh, I sat at his table in Campion Hall when, I'm, when I was in Oxford ah. doing Greek lunches, uh, reading through uh, John's Gospel with him. And that, that's great. Thank you for but that. But also one... But one of the nicest people you're ever going to meet in your life yeah. is the other thing I want to add. So. Yeah, absolutely. If that, if that influences translation, I don't know, but um, certainly <laughs> he is nice. <laughs> Right, we're going to turn open and open this up to the wider floor now. Um, I think um, Father Sam has a question. Uh, he probably had one of the earliest ones to put his hand up. Um, so go for it, Father. Um, yes, thank you very much for, for this evening. I, I, when you um, proposed the topic, I was, I was very pleased because I, I do find Paul very difficult to love. Uh, not, not because of his theology, the, the, uh, theology necessarily or because of his, his writing, but uh, as, as a person. Um, and I think, I think being very English, I think I bristled slightly at, at what comes across, certainly in the translations I read, as being quite arrogant and sort of the, oh, you just follow me, just, just copy what I'm doing, just be like me, yeah. uh, which, I, which I find very difficult. And if anyone else think, anyone thinks anything different from, from me, they're wrong. 
Yes, yeah, and I, and I think so. I, I think my sort of English sensibilities prevent me from being too enthusiastic about him because of that reason. Um, and also, I and this is the question really whether it's whether this is a completely unfair thought and coloured by my my uh, bristling of him is that I've never really considered him to be an apostle um, because his experience is so vastly different from those others who are called apostle. Mm -hmm. uh, and in terms of his relationship with Christ and, and what he's experienced mm -hmm. and what he's lived through. Um, and, and so it always sits uncomfortably with me that he sort of claims the same apostolic um, position as Peter um, when, when, they're, when his relationship with Jesus is very, very different. And whether that is completely unfair, whether that is me being off the wall or whether any other people have mentioned that as a thing. Well, it's, it's the fundamental problem he's got in, with his earliest communities um, because um, and you can, you can see it writ large in 1 and 2 Corinthians. It's where it comes to the fore, um, especially. Um, because if you are an early community um, following Christ, and you want to say, how do I trust you? Um, there are various rules by which you would work out whether you would trust someone. So you would say, well, were you one of the 12? Um, and then you would say, okay, so you're not one of the 12. Were you one of the 70 or 72? Um, okay, not one of the 70 or 72. Well, are you trusted by one of the 12 or one of the 70 or 72? Um, 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 have you been sent directly from them? And you, so you can feel this kind of the ranking of um, authority in the, um, in the early communities. And Paul just says, no, and no, and no, I know, but I saw a vision. Um, and you could just imagine in terms of authority today, somebody turning up going, you know, well, are you ordained? You know, have you been licensed? But I saw a vision and you go, oh, that's all right then. Um, Is the but I think that's no. kind of one. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but you see, that, that's Paul's problem. Um, and, and in terms of authenticity and authority, that's the problem he runs with, um, runs across the whole of the time. Um, and I think there were people in the earliest communities who never believed him. And the, the mistake we always make, I think, in reading the Pauline epistles um, is, um, and again, you see it in 1 and 2 Corinthians. Um, I'm sorry, I just love them too much. I kind of come back with them all the time. Is we assume that Paul writes a letter and then they go, oh, yes, silly us. Um, of course you're right. Whereas 1 and 2 Corinthians are very clear where they're going, no, we don't agree. No, you're wrong. Absolutely wrong. I mean, in 2 Corinthians, um, you get to um, 2 Corinthians 3, and they're saying, well, show us your letter of recommendation. We don't trust you. Give us your reference. And Paul says, the reference is written on your hearts. Nice move um, for your next job interview. Um, but it's kind of, it, you see in that, um, that you're exactly with the Corinthians. Not the Sam, you know, that's you and they are together um, in their questioning of who Paul was. Um, and, um, and there is, um, what is fascinating is that the movement post Paul um, then begins to accept his authority, but he only has an accepted authority um, because of his epistles. And that's why, you know, that's when you get into Paul's theology. Thank you. Um, Charlotte, we've got more than one Charlotte actually. Charlotte Gibson with her hand in the air. Hi Paula, thank you. Hi Charlotte. Um, so I've just written a really horrible essay on Paul. Uh, <laughs> I would love to have phoned you before now. Um, I to Next know. time you'll have to make sure you do. <laughs> yeah, but I can't really reference phone call with Paula Gooder. <laughs> um, <laughs> no, it wouldn't work really, would it? So, um, what's my question? My question is, what do you think of Doug Campbell's idea of Romans 1 to 3 being a Socratic reading? Because you talked a bit about the Greek philosophy, yeah. um, and I found it very convincing, but that's because I know so little about Paul that I read anything and I'm just convinced there and then. Um, well, and also you're being taught by one of the other people who's completely convinced that Campbell's right. Um, I'm not myself convinced um, because I don't see um, the mo. I, I I think I think there is definite influence of Socratic um, methodology in Romans that I agree with, but I think it's one of those where I think Campbell is kind of half right and he's pressed it a little bit over far. 
Um, so therefore, I, it's um, a little bit like John Bowker's theory I referred to, is that I think in it are absolute pieces of gold which you can pick up and begin to make sense. But the biggest argument I would put against him being completely right is that there isn't an apparent gap between three and four. Um, the, the language doesn't change, the, um, the structure doesn't change. Um, and you would need, um, for his theory to be right, you would need there to be a big disjunction between three and four, a little bit like in 2 Corinthians between chapters nine and 10, where, you know, it's, it's almost completely, it's almost like he's woken up um, in a completely different mood and started writing entirely differently. So I think Campbell's view is really helpful for understanding that naughty bit of one to three, but I'm, I wouldn't go all the way with it would be my answer. Sorry, that's a technical. That was a technical answer to one, one person's um, theory. But uh, Thank what you. did you? So, are you more convinced by it, Charlotte? Well, I'm one of those people that doesn't really like to read Paul. <laughs> um, <laughs> but so yeah, I, I think I found it convincing, but probably because it makes Paul look like me yeah. in the theology. So I think I found Campbell's argument really helpful to get my head around Paul and not necessarily very helpful for actually having a well-rounded view of Paul. Yeah. And the other thing I would just say, um, which is um, where I am different from a lot of Pauline scholars, is I think that um, your understanding of the centre of Paul's theology is affected by which epistle you read the most. And most Pauline scholars read Romans. Um, and then what they do is they say Romans is the middle and then we'll work our way outwards from Romans and see how the rest fits with Romans. Where I think one or two Corinthians, shock news, um, is the middle. And then if you read outwards from one or two Corinthians, you get a very different kind of Paul. Um, and that makes, for me, makes a difference to how you read. And the key difference it makes is that in particularly in two Corinthians, Paul is a vulnerable um, quite upset, um, slightly traumatised person in ministry, and you get a very different perception of him as a person than you do from the very confident Paul who writes Romans where he kind of lays it all out. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Father Daniel has a virtual hand in the air. Sorry, it's on my phone, it's all a bit chaotic. Uh, I actually nearly burnt down the kitchen in the first half of your lecture, Paula, so I might have missed some of the key elements. <laughs> it was very exciting. Um, but um, actually, that follows on perfectly from um, what you just said. I was, I was just quite interested in what, whether you thought or how you thought Paul uh, matured in his thoughts or how he might have um, changed his mind about things uh, and how that might affect how he read him. Yeah, I mean... I do think he changes his mind. Um, I mean, I think he changes his mind mid-epistle, let alone mid-ministry. <laughs> um, you can find moments where, you know, he suddenly goes, oh, no, no, I think this, really. Um, and so, it, and, and again, but this is where you kind of get the pull that you are, that you see. So I'm not a systematic theologian. So I, therefore, don't see Paul writing systematic theology. Mm. Um, I think Paul is writing experiential theology. Um, and therefore, I see a certain Paul, and I'm conscious that, that is very much the case. The problem with um, the answer to your question is, um, if only we knew how to date his epistles, we'd yeah. be more confident about how he changed his mind. The really crucial one is whether Galatians is very early or very late. Um, because if Galatians is very early, then you can track the way in which he changes his mind all the way through. No, the other way around, I'm wrong, I'm the other way around. So um, if, if one Thessalonians is the very earliest one, um, then actually he changes his mind. Whereas if Galatians is very early, then Galatians is the beginning and Romans is the end, and then he doesn't change his mind. So it, it does affect how you do your dating. Um, and as you will know, dating Paul's epistles um, is not easy. There's no such thing as a consensus of the dating of Paul's epistles. No. And does that, I mean, just sorry, just a, a follow on, really, because I guess, it, I mean, it, his texts are so crucial for some of the big questions uh, that divide the church still. Um, yes. I mean, how, just from your experience, like, how does that, how much awareness of, of, of those uh, uh, distinctions are made within those conversations? 
uh, and the delicacy in which you approach it. Are you thinking things like justification by faith? Is that? Yeah, that exactly. Yeah, um, that's a great battle amongst the evangelicals about what, yes. what does Paul believe. Uh, <laughs> but I, I suppose also, I mean, some of the reasons why you know he's such an appealing author as a, a practical theologian has applied theology about yeah. um, you know women in church or uh, and so on. Yeah. Yeah, um, and I, I think I think that's that's the really. I mean, I, I often wonder whether Paul expects us still to be reading him quite as we are reading him. Um, I like to think that he might be a little bit surprised and just go, no, you weren't still meant to be reading it like that. Um, I might be wrong. Um, you might have gone, no, and if you disagree with me, you'd be wrong. You might still be there. Um, and I, I think the stuff around, I mean, the justification by faith stuff is very, very interesting. Um, and some of you will know that there was a very, very significant ecumenical um, document published recently, which in which the Lutherans and the Catholics agreed on justification by faith. And it's one of those where um, um, it, it hasn't been given the publicity it ought to have had, um, because it, that is a really, really significant um, moment where Lutherans and Catholics can agree on what on the significance of justification by faith. But while that's happening, um, the Reformed and the Lutherans have now fallen out on what justification by faith means. So the conflict just moves somewhere else within the Christian world. So yeah, I think, I think the really interesting thing is that Paul, Paul's views apparently can shift and change according to the person who's reading them. And that then raises for you some really interesting questions about how you best um, engage with them. You know, you mentioned um, the question around women. And um, I think for me, the really interesting thing is that I can read Paul and say Paul is absolutely positive about women's ministry, whereas other people can read Paul and say Paul is absolutely opposed to women's ministry. And in that is really something really interesting, I think, about therefore what that means about how we're reading Paul and what Paul says to us about certain things. And at least should cause us to stop and think a little bit. Haven't quite answered your question, but wandered around it a little bit. Thank you. Does anyone else have a question? If you have, please raise your hand, either physically or virtually, you gesticulate. You can also type questions in the chat box if you want. Uh, people have done that in the past. I don't see any other hands raised. Um, nope, I don't believe so. Last chance. No. All right, quiet. Pressure for you. <laughs> We've all been wowed by that amazing wisdom. It take a while to to sort of digest it, I guess. Can I, can I end, uh, Father Chris? By just kind of um emphasizing something I didn't quite emphasize as, mu as much as I wanted to in, in the talk. I'll be very quick. Um, but for me, the really, really key thing about Paul, and this is my reading of Paul, um, is that Paul was, um, was a mystic. And Paul's theology, therefore, emerged out of a mystical encounter with the risen, ascended Christ. And that's what shaped um, who he was. Um, and that's why his theology plays differently for different people because he was, he was working it out. Um, and the bit I think is a bit sad about Paul is that people don't um, pay close enough attention to his religious experiences and what difference that makes to how he writes his theology. That's my slightly radical point that I would just like to chuck in at the end for you to contemplate. Thank you, that's fascinating. And uh, Stacy has been writing in the text to say that there may well be more about that next next time. Oh, fab, excellent, hurrah. So I'll have to come back. I have a trailer for you to, uh, to come back on the 23rd, not next week, the 23rd, uh, when Stacy will be talking to us uh, about Edith Stein. And, uh, and we're all very much looking forward to that. I am kicking myself because I have scheduled my annual parish meeting. So I'm very, very, very sorry that I won't be here in, in, in person, although I'm looking forward to watching the recording. And uh, I guess that's, uh, that's a pointer to me to, uh, to remind everyone that if you want to come back to uh, watch this again 
or um, or do tell your your friends all about uh, Towers of Faith and what we're doing because uh, all of the talks and lectures that we've been having are available on the website towersoffaith.com uh, to be to be viewed again at your at your leisure. Um, so uh, it just remains for me to thank Paula once again for that really fascinating talk on St Paul. It was such a good evening. Thank you so much. I think we've uh, begun this second season of our Towers of Faith lectures uh, in the best possible way. Um, so thank you so much for that and uh, I look forward to seeing many of you again at the next lecture on the 23rd. Thank you again and good night.